Hey guys, we're going to talk about <clears throat> ecosystem ecology and the movement of energy and the evolution of biodiversity. What this covers is the first part of chapter three, um, which is the part where we talk about the movement of energy, but before we talk about the movement of matter, because it's going to come a little later, and all of chapter five. So if you're following me with Friedman and Ralea, this is the first module of chapter three and all of chapter five. All right, let's talk a little bit about biodiversity. Um, again, a lot of this you should have had in biology. Um, some of it's going to be new, but most of it's a rehash. So a species is a group of organisms that are distinct from other organisms in size, shape, behavior, and biochemical properties. And these uh, organisms can interbreed with one another to produce viable offspring. When I say viable, I mean that the offspring can, they themselves can reproduce and, and, um, and create babies that can reproduce themselves. So there are many examples of species that can mate but the, um, the offspring of that mating cannot mate themselves and produce babies. So like a horse and a donkey can mate and they produce a mule, but two mules cannot reproduce and create another mule. Uh, mules are sterile. And so there's, there's many examples of that. Estimating the number of species on earth is a challenge. Why? Well, a whole bunch of species are microscopic, meaning that they're too tiny for us to see. So how can you even actually measure them? Uh, some are active only at night, they're nocturnal, and still others live in places that are totally inaccessible, such as the deep ocean. You're not going to send a submarine down to do like a, a count of two worms in the Marianas Trench. It's just too time consuming and too expensive to do that. So we have to kind of extrapolate from sort of what we know when we talk about how many species are there on Earth. Most scientists estimate that there are about 10 million species on Earth. That should say million, not millions. There are about 10 million species on Earth, uh, give or take. Species are not uniformly distributed, meaning that they, they don't... Um, they tend to clump in certain areas. Well, of course, you know why they clump, because resources are available in certain areas where they're not in others. So to measure species diversity, scientists measure two things. They measure species richness and species evenness, and those are exactly what they sound like. Species richness is the number of species in a given area, and that correlates um, with biodiversity. Species evenness is the relative proportion of individuals within different species in a given area. This tells us whether an ecosystem is dominated by one species or if all of the species have similar abundances. So you can have a species, you can have an ecosystem that is rich in different number of species, the number of different species in a given area. However, it may not have a high species evenness, meaning that even though there's like 25 different species in the area, it may be dominated by one particular, numerically dominated by one particular type of species, such as, I don't know, howler monkeys. There might be more howler monkeys there than there are um, leaf cutter ants or something like that. So you can have a high species richness and a low species evenness. It just depends on the ecosystem. Species richness and species evenness often declines after human disturbance. In fact, it almost always does. So knowing the information about an ecosystem gives scientists a baseline um, from which they can determine change. Um, there really aren't very many ecosystems on Earth that aren't uh, being profoundly influenced by the action of man. And so uh, we try to get a baseline on what the ecosystem would look like without the influence of man so that we can um, estimate what kind of impact we, we ourselves are having on an ecosystem. Uh, the branching pattern of evolutionary relationships is called a phylogeny, and that's what you're looking at right here. Uh, those of you who have taken AP Bio, you are familiar with this. These are the branches of a phylogenetic tree, and phylogenetic trees are based on morphology, which is uh, body shape, changes in body shape, behavior, and genetics. So I chose this one because um, I thought it was one that people would be familiar with. So if we look, um, 
the time goes from left to right, and that would be down here along the x-axis. So this would be ancient time, a long time ago, and then over here would be modern stuff. Okay, so this would be our starting point right here uh, with an organism that was kind of the common ancestor to everything uh, that's, I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything that's on the phylogenetic tree. Uh, there was a branch point. This is the first branch point, right? And that's, it's labeled that branch point number one. At that branch point number one, the lungfishes evolved. Uh, lungfishes are a very ancient type of fish and it, they are what they sound like they are. They're fishes with rudimentary lungs. Um, at this branch point, tetrapod limbs was our defining characteristic. So lungfishes did not evolve tetrapod limbs. So they went a different evolutionary direction. So tetrapod limbs is our uh, defining characteristic right here. You can see it. And as we move on, here's our branch point two. And this is the branch point two between amphibians and um, what do we say? Uh, pretty much anything else. So our branch point two is where our amphibians kind of branch off and that right there amphibians go one way and the evolution of the amniotic egg the amniotic sac is our branch point here all right and so branch point three is mammals right and here we go mammals go one way and then we've got lizards and snakes going the other way and then um, from lizards and snakes we've got homologous characteristics oh wait amnions here so uh, our branch point here would be our amnion. Mammals are, um, our amnion is actually internal. Um, it's part of the, the sac that the baby grows into. Um, lizards and snakes, crocodiles, ostriches, hawks, and other birds also have amniotic eggs. Um, lizard snakes, crocodiles, birds, um, ostriches, hawks, and other birds, these guys all have amniotic eggs. We, mammals have amniotic sacs that are internal. So we've got these branch points here between lizards and snakes. We branch off again, crocodiles. We branch off again, ostriches, hawks, and other birds. And you can see our branch point here is feathers, hawks, and other birds. Um, I have yet to see a phylogenetic tree on any apes exam, but you need to know how to read them and what they mean. Um, it's just a branching pattern of evolutionary relationships, and each branch point represents the evolution of a new trait, whether that's, amni uh, whether that's tetrapod limbs, an amniotic sac, um, a tri-chambered heart, whatever that happens to be, each branch point is where uh, the two, two lineages branch off and, the, and split off from one another. So evolution as a definition is the change in the frequency of alleles in a population over time. If you don't remember what an allele is, an allele is a variant of a gene. And I'm writing that down for you. If you need to know more, there's more in your textbook um, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it. But again, this is background information. Microevolution is evolution below the species level. And when I talk about microevolution, I'm talking about types and varieties of an organism within a species. Macroevolution is the collection of genetic changes that give rise to new genera, to new families, to new classes, or to new phyla. Genes are the physical locations on chromosomes that code for a particular trait. Again, alleles are variations of genes. The complete set of genes in an individual is called its genotype, and an individual's phenotype, its actual physical characteristics, are coded by, uh, for, by the genotype. So the way that you, the reason that you look the way you do is because you have DNA, your genotype is actually coding for those traits. However, Phenotypes can also be influenced by environmental conditions. Um, I'm going to tell you perfectly honestly that this is not well understood in human beings. However, in many, many, many other species, we know that environmental conditions can actually change phenotype. One of the most um, 
stunning examples of this is that there are many amphibians and um, species of fish where the temperature of the water that they're living in determines whether or not the individual is male or female. So that is um, an example of an environmental condition that influences the expression or the phenotypical expression of a genotype. Uh, mutations are interesting. Mutation, just by its definition, is a random copying error in an individual's genetic code. Now, when I say mutation, most people think that those are harmful. However, most mutations are actually silent. That is, they really don't produce a change in the organism's phenotype. And this is, this is because most organisms have a whole bunch of genes that are not actually turned on. They're not actually in use in an organism. So those can be, um, can be accumulating mutations all day long, and they will never actually change the physical characteristics or the phenotype of an organism because they're not in use. So most mutations are actually silent. However, some can be detrimental, meaning that they harm the organism, and some can actually improve an individual's chances of survival and reproduction. Mutations increase the genetic diversity of a species. The genetic diversity of a species is also increased through recombination. This happens during sexual reproduction. A normal genetic, uh, recombination is a normal genetic process where one part of a chromosome breaks off and it attaches to another chromosome. So this is not actually producing new genes, but it is, it's kind of shuffling the alleles. It's shuffling the, the variants of the gene. And again, it only happens during sexual reproduction. So organisms that reproduce sexually, uh, plants, animals, those organisms uh, experience genetic diversity through recombination. So there are three processes that um, evolution occurs by. Uh, artificial selection, natural selection, which is probably the one you're most familiar with, and then random processes. So we're going to take these bit by bit. Evolution by artificial selection occurs when humans select the traits they desire in a species, and then they breed organisms to develop those traits. So I want you to take a look at the picture that's over here. So there is a organism, it's shown right here. Um, it says Brassica ole oleracea, which is actually wild mustard. That's the common name for it. And this is an organism that actually grows wild across um, much of the world. Humans learned early on that this particular plant was edible and that if they bred this plant with other plants um, of its same species that had certain traits they were looking for, then they could create um, different plants. So if you take a look here, if they were to breed um, this wild mustard with other wild mustard that had large terminal buds, they, we ended up producing a cabbage from that. If the selection was based on lateral buds, lateral are the ones on the outside, like not the tip top, but the ones that grow sideways, uh, we ended up with the, plant, the Brussels sprouts plant. If we were looking for the actual stem part, if we were looking, uh, if we were breeding uh, wild mustard that had fat stems, eventually we would get kohl kohlrabi, which is um, of the same family, but it's got these, these thick stems that you can eat. If you were selecting for um, these wild mustard where you were breeding ones that had nice fat leaves, eventually you could breed kale. If you were taking the same plant and you were selecting them for stems and flowers, you would end up with broccoli. Broccoli are the stems and flowers of uh, highly bred wild mustard. And then finally, if you were selecting for flower clusters, you'd end up with a cauliflower. So cabbage, Brussels sprout, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower are all related. They're the, from the same family, and they are all um, relatives. They were all selectively bred from Brassica oleracea, which is the wild mustard plant. It's artificial selection because we did it. All right, so this is also how we have different breeds of dogs. You guys know that dogs, um, you know, they basically all evolved from wolves, and we bred 
certain individuals to have certain types of traits, whether that were physical, whether those were physical traits like, you know, coat color or the size of the legs or those kinds of things, or behavioral traits like, um, you know, dogs that were good hunting dogs or dogs that would, were good herding dogs. Uh, we, we would select for a certain type of trait and we would breed individuals that showed that trait until we got what they call a pure breeding line. Um, most, it's a, right here it says many of our agricultural crops, pretty much most of our agricultural crops are the result of artificial selection. So, um, you know, when we're talking about corn or wheat or rye or barley or rice, all of those were once originally wild plants that humans uh, decided that they were going to breed and create and artificially select for certain characteristics for uh, corn is probably the most interesting of those in terms of how different it is from its um, from its wild ancestor. But um, but yeah, so humans, we find a plant we like or we find an organism we like and we keep breeding it until we get the traits that we want. This is called artificial selection. Natural selection is what you guys learned about in biology. It's an evolutionary mechanism where the environmental conditions determine which individuals survive and reproduce. And this is the key right here environmental conditions determine. It's the environment that determines uh, which individuals are most adapted uh, and will survive and reproduce. Charles Darwin was the first scientist to provide a cohesive theory of natural selection. That's not to say he was the first to propose the idea, nor was he um, really the only one that was working during that time period who, who was thinking along these lines. However, he was the first to provide a cohesive theory and frankly, he was the first to publish. Natural selection has five basic ideas. The first of those is that individuals produce an excess of offspring. That means that they produce more offspring than will survive. And that leads us to the second trait or the second basic idea that not all offspring will survive. Some are gonna die. Individuals also have different traits and that's the result of genetic diversity. Different traits are passed from parents to offspring. Uh, sexual reproduction passes those, those traits from parents to offspring. Differences in traits are associated with differential abilities to survive and reproduce. We're saying that because we have different genotypes, um, we end up with different abilities to survive and reproduce. This is natural selection. Natural selection favors a combination of traits that improve an individual's fitness. The fitness in terms of natural selection, fitness is an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. These traits are called adaptations. Welcome back to biology, friends. Um, in fact, this particular picture that I pulled here, I, I think it's kind of elementary, but I, I liked it. So one of the things that you guys talked about in biology was plant adaptations. Um, so in the desert, plants have very, very visible adaptations to the harsh conditions of the desert. The limiting factor in the desert is, of course, water. It's got high solar radiation and it's got low water. So the plants have to develop adaptations uh, that, that um, increase their ability to survive and reproduce under such harsh conditions. So you can see um, we're talking about some root systems here. So some desert plants have horizontal root systems that are just below the surface, meaning that they can spread their roots wide and they can collect little teeny bits of moisture that might fall in the form of dew. Some plants in the desert have very, very, very deep tap roots. Um, there is groundwater in the desert, but it's deep. And so these plants have evolved the mechanism of having very deep tap roots that can reach all the way down to that groundwater. In terms of what's above the ground, some of these organisms, some of these plants have small leaves. Uh, their leaves may be actually turned or um, uh, evolved into spines. Their leaves are glossy or waxy. That means that they um, have a lot of waxy coating to reduce water loss. Some desert plants store water in their roots and stems and leaves. These are called succulents. We also sometimes kind of commonly call those cacti. That's not the, that's not the exact correct term. Um, if it's something that we, you would think of as a cactus, uh, we normally, the, we, in science, we call those succulents. They're storing water in the stems, roots, and fruit. 
The other adaptation that desert plants often have to these harsh conditions is that the seeds can stay dormant for many years. So these plants may produce seeds, but they only germinate when there is a, um, a water event or when water is available. Uh, and that is a, a um, positive adaptation for desert plants. So um, we talked about artificial selection. We talked about natural selection. Uh, the third type of thing that we said drived, uh, drove evolution were random processes. So what the heck are those? Well, those are mutations, gene flow, genetic drift, the bottleneck effect, and the founder effect. Some Again, some of these you have heard of, especially if you've taken AP Bio, but if you haven't, we need to kind of go through these briefly. So mutations are random changes in DNA that occur during cell reproduction. We've already talked about those. Most mutations are non-lethal. In, in fact, most are silent, meaning that they don't actually produce a phenotypic change. But mutations increase the genetic diversity of a species. Gene flow is a process by which individuals move or flow from one population to another. And this alters the genetic composition of both the original population and the population into which the individuals flow. Gene flow can be very helpful in bringing genetic variation to populations. So let's take the example of the Florida panther. The Florida panther um, is a a, a, a big cat that's present um, natively in South Florida. This panther traditionally experienced very high gene flow with other local panther populations, uh, not just within their own um, subspecies, but with other pan panther populations. By 1995, however, the number of Florida panthers was only 30 individuals, and they were all confined to a small area in South Florida. The reason for this was habitat loss from human development and, frankly, from poaching. People were shooting them. The low population number of only 30 individuals led to inbreeding because the population wasn't large enough. And when you inbreed, when populations inbreed, when the, um, when the population has a... Um, when it's very low and when the individuals are related, you get the expression of recessive alleles. Recessive alleles are often harmful. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in an, in an attempt to save the Florida panther, captured eight Texas panthers, which are another subspecies, but they can interbreed with Florida panther, and they introduced them to Florida with the hopes of increasing gene flow within the Florida panther population. This actually worked. The uh, amount of inbreeding decreased, and the population rose from 30 to 160 individuals. Now, this is still critically endangered, um, but this is a, a way that, that you know, the humans can intervene and increase gene flow uh, within a very isolated and critically endangered population. So genetic drift is a change in the genetic composition of a population over time as the result of random mating. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, let, we're gonna take a look at these, the picture and the reason that I chose the picture here. So genetic drift is actually maladaptive, meaning it's not a great thing. And it is seen most often in small populations. In small populations, random mating among individuals has the potential to eliminate some rare phenotypes simply because those phenotypes did not find a mate in that year. So the population drifts away towards less diversity. So let's take a look at what I'm looking at. So I'm taking a look at this picture right here. This is my first generation, okay? And you don't need to worry about the P and the Q there. The P is the frequency of the dominant allele and the Q is the frequency of the recessive allele, but that's not really important to what we're talking about. So I want you to take a look at the pink flowers and the white flowers. If you can take a look here, there are far more pink flowers than there are white flowers. The white flower is the rare phenotype, okay? This little spot right here says that only five of the 10 plants leave offspring in any uh, in this particular year. Um, and this is random. So only five of those 10 plants are actually being pollinated and producing offspring, okay? So, and when we look at generation uh, two here, we've got one, two, three white and one, two, three, four, five pink ones, okay? One, two, three, 
four or five, six pink ones, excuse me. So we still have um, fewer white than we do pink because remember white was our, um, was our uh, rare allele in this particular case. Now in the next event here, it says only two of these 10 plants leave offspring. Well, the two that leaves offspring are these two that are highlighted in white. And again, this is the result of random mating. These particular two were pink. So none of the white flowers actually got pollinated that year. So in generation three, do you see any white flowers at all? There are zero white flowers in generation three. So we've reduced our genetic diversity, but it was because of random happenstance. This is genetic drift and it is maladaptive. Um, so again, because this was a small population, we only had 10 plants here, um, only due just completely to random mating uh, characteristics, we lost our recessive white allele because of pollination patterns. And again, um, anytime we reduce genetic variation in a population, we consider this maladaptive, which means it's a bad thing. The bottleneck effect is a drastic reduction in the size of a population that leads to a reduction in genetic um, diversity. Generally speaking, this is a result of an abiotic change. Um, it often occurs as the result of a natural disaster, but it can occur from other reasons. So a natural disaster will create a population bottleneck. So will drastic habitat loss. Um, hunting or harvesting by humans can create a population bottleneck, as can rapid environmental change. Um, when the size of a population is quickly reduced, the amount of genetic variation is of course also reduced. With fewer individuals, we have fewer unique genotypes. This is another part of what happened with the Florida panther. Um, there were several things going on with that. We had habitat loss, um, so we had reduced uh, gene flow, but we also had a bottleneck effect there because of uh, the habitat loss actually caused um, some of the some of the rarer genotypes to, um, to disappear. So less diversity leads to less ability to adapt to changes in environmental conditions and a greater chance of extinction. So again, the smaller the population and the fewer alleles, the, the uh, less genetic diversity in a population, the less ability they have to adapt to changing environmental conditions and the greater their chance of extinction. Uh, one of the examples that your book gives is the modern day cheetah population. If you um, take DNA from today's cheetahs, you will find that most of them were descended from common ancestors as little as 10,000 years ago. Uh, modern cheetahs have very, very, very little genetic diversity. The reason why, we're not exactly sure what happened, but about 10,000 years ago, there was a bottleneck, uh, a, ge a genetic bottleneck in that population. We don't know if it was environmental change or if there was a, I mean, there were paleo hunters at the time. We don't know if it was a hunting, an overhunting thing. But about 10,000 years ago, most of the cheetah population was wiped out and there was a um, population bottleneck. And so there were only a few breeding pairs. And today's modern cheetahs are all descended from just a few individuals that survived that population bottleneck about 10,000 years ago. So the founder effect is a change in genetic composition, composition of a population as the result of the descent from a small number of colonizing individuals. And if you think about the word colonizing, oops, I'm moving stuff around again. Um, colonizing and founder kind of, they, they correlate, right? So people who um, colonize something are generally considered the founders of whatever that, that thing is. Um, we see this a lot in island populations. Island populations often show the results of the founder effect um, because only a random subset of the mainland population would have colonized the island. Sometimes the colonization, uh, colonization is deliberate like in the case of humans that are traveling to an island to uh, to create a society there, that would be deliberate colonization. However, sometimes the colonization is completely random. Like when we're talking about non-human populations that accidentally get blown out to an island, um, they may be blown out during a storm um, if they're birds, or they might get washed out. If they're terrestrial animals, they might get washed out and they um, survive in the water until they get to the island. So those would be accidental colonizations. But in any case, um, 
the individuals that colonize are kind of a random um, subset of what was on that mainland, um, and you might not have all the mainland alleles represented. So let's take a look at this particular picture. So in our particular, in our founding pop, excuse me, in our original population, um, if you look at the two different alleles, the ancestral population, we have 50% red and 50% green. Um, but just through to random chance, this particular subset ends up getting transported to a new location, whether that's an actual physical island or uh, an isolated location that's on the same continent, who knows. But you can see that the allele frequencies in the founding population are different from the original 50-50. If you look here, it just says um, the red is 20% and the green is 80%. So over time, we have mating that's occurring between the um, red and the green individuals. So after generation three, we actually have a 60-40. Um, uh, the green is 40% and the red is 60%. Even though we started with more green due to um, the random mating characteristics, and it could just very much be that um, it, in this particular case, it looks that like perhaps the red is better suited to the new environment because they seem to be surviving and reproducing better. And that particular um, hypothesis would be supported by the fact that after generation five, we have 100% of the red allele and 0% of the green allele. So whereas in the originating population, we had 50% red and 50% green, uh, and we would assume that the environmental conditions supported those adaptations between red and green, they both had the, the equal chance of surviving in that particular environment. Whatever this new environment is, is favoring the red allele over the green allele, even though the green allele started as the majority in the beginning of the founding population. So um, this is actually showing the founder effect along with a genetic drift effect here uh, because there's something in the new environment that is causing a, um, a, a differential um, change in the ability to survive and reproduce of a certain type of allele here. So one new way that species is, are created is through geographic isolation. This is actually the physical separation of a group of individuals from others of the same group. And you probably, you've heard of this before. I know we, we teach it in biology, so I know you've heard it. The process of speciation that occurs when geographic isolation uh, with geographic isolation is called allopatric speciation. And that should actually be in bold. That's why I'm kind of circling it there. Allopatric speciation is, again, the divergence occurs due to geographic isolation. So let's take a look at this picture here. So here's our original population. We have white mousies. We've got like one, two, three, four, five, six mousies. And the river you can see is on the left-hand side. And all of these mice are on the right-hand side of the river. Well, the river boot changes course. So we go from here to here. And while the during this change of course in the river, the original population gets separated. So we've got four on one side and we've got two on the other and the river is separating them. And we're assuming that they cannot actually um, cross the river easily. And so over time, we have a genetic divergence, meaning that um, as those two populations uh, breed within themselves, there's going to be a change in alleles, um, you know, due to random mutation, due to um, genetic drift. Uh, the populations are going to evolve independently of one another. And so over time, you can see that we get some uh, phenotypic changes there on one side of the river. And eventually we end up with two different species. Um, they, they have uh, been separated for so long that they can no longer interbreed. And when the river changes back course, it changes its course once again, and these individuals can actually cross the river, uh, these guys can no longer interbreed with these guys. So the, the dark brown mice can no longer interbreed with the white mice because they've been separated long enough that the, um, the, de the genetic changes have created two different species. And um, that's what we call reproductive isolation. So that's this third bullet point here. The separated populations breed independently of each other, and eventually the geographic isolation also produces reproductive isolation, meaning that the populations become two different species and they can no longer interbreed with one another. So sympatric speciation is the evolution of one species into two species 
without geographic isolation. So again, allopatric means that they're separated geographically. Sympatric means that we're evolving two species without that separation. So this is usually a result of something what we call polyploidy, um, where the number of chromosomes is increased from the usual two. In most organisms, you get one set of chromosomes from your mom and one from your dad. But in certain organisms, um, you can actually have more than one set. Um, this is most often seen in plants. There are some animals that show this, but not, not what I, no mammals and not what I would call anything that's like um, super highly evolved. So when we're talking about plants, bananas, strawberries, and wheat um, are often polyploid, meaning that they have more than two sets of Chromosomes. In fact, strawberries can go up to eight sets of chromosomes. Um, some amphibians and some gastropods, so salamanders and snails, show polyploidy, but not all, and it's actually very uncommon. Um, it's it. The reason why is that animal genomes become much, much more complex. And um, when we are talking about uh, things that can go wrong in genomes, polyploidy is usually something that contributes to um, deleterious effects on an organism. So polyploidy can occur randomly as a result um, of just random chance, but it can also occur as the result of deliberate human actions. In fact, bananas strawberries and wheat are all polyploid because humans have bred them to be that way. We would not have a modern banana or a strawberry or a wheat, I say a wheat, a wheat plant, um, if it were not for artificial selection for polyploid organisms. Um, polyploid individuals can only interbreed with other polyploid individuals who have the same number of chromosomes. So like, let's say you have two banana plants. One banana plant is polyploid with four sets of chromosomes. The other is polyploid with two sets of chromosomes. Even though they're both polyploid, they cannot interbreed because they do not have the same sets of chromosomes. So um, we usually polyploidy is um, is kind of a dead end. Um, when, when Especially when it's been artificially induced by humans, oftentimes uh, the breeding has to be done by humans, meaning that in plants that are polyploid artificially, humans have to do the pollen the pollination so that those plants can actually continue to breed. Um, and that's that's definitely the case in, in bananas. Bananas, can, modern bananas cannot, cannot breed by themselves because they've been so genetically modified. Um, the polyploid individuals um, often give rise to new species because when we're when you're breeding individuals that have like you know four and eight sets of chromosomes over and over, those organisms tend to look very very different. And of course, they can't interbreed. I mean, the definition of a species is that you can interbreed um, with other members of your species, but when you don't have the same sets of chromosomes, we don't have the same number, you can't do that. So by definition, polyploid individuals um, create a, a new species from that is distinct from their, um, from their original um, ancestors. The ability of a species to survive environmental change depends on how quickly it can evolve the adaptations that are needed to, to uh, survive or to thrive and reproduce in changing environmental conditions. So uh, the better and the more quickly able, uh, the more quickly you're able to adapt to environmental change, the better your chance at surviving that change. If a species cannot adapt quickly enough, it will go extinct. Any process that reduces genetic diversity of a population will also reduce its ability to adapt to environmental change. So all of these things that we've talked about that reduce genetic diversity when we're talking about um, you know, genetic drift, um, bottleneck effect, founder's effect, all of those things that reduce genetic diversity, they are also reducing the ability of a population to adapt to environmental change. Evolution can actually occur rapidly in populations of genetically modified organisms. Genetically modified organisms are called GMOs. GMOs are by their definition transgenic. That means that humans have inserted the genes of other species that code for desirable traits into the organisms. For instance, corn plants in the United States have a bacterial genome that has been inserted in them uh, for um, pest resistance. That makes the corn plant naturally resistant to certain pests that might harm it. 
And that's transgenic because the corn by itself would never evolve bacterial uh, DNA, would never evolve bacterial alleles. Humans have put those bacterial alleles into the corn. So these are transgenic organisms. So when these organisms reproduce, they pass on the genes that we have inserted with those desirable traits onto their offspring. This process is much more rapid than even artificial selection in the production of desirable traits. So remember, artificial selection is the selective breeding of organisms uh, with desirable traits to produce a certain outcome. But if we can just put those traits in straight into an individual's genome, we are actually producing uh, evolution at the genetic level. So um, as soon as we put those genes in and those organisms reproduce and pass those genes onto their offspring, we have literally created, uh, we, have, we have influenced um, evolution. So scientists now are not limited to naturally occurring genes within a population. Like I told you, uh, we are, most of our corn plants now have bacterial DNA in them in the, uh, in the form of pesticide resistance, excuse me, pest resistance, um, natural pesticide. And there are many, many, many other examples of this. Uh, transgenics or GMOs are a big deal. Uh, most of our agricultural crops, our big agricultural crops are transgenic at this point. They're GMOs. Uh, we are also experimenting with transgenic stuff in our meat supply. Uh, this is, a, as we head into our agricultural unit, this is something that uh, we're going to talk about, pros and cons of this kind of stuff. Kind of like science fiction. All right, so um, as we kind of move into um, kind of actual ecology here, we need to talk about niches. Every species has a niche. Each species has a range of tolerance for abiotic factors, abiotic factors, non-living factors. What do I mean? Well, I mean temperature, humidity, salinity, pH, and so on. So there's only a certain range of those things, temperature, humidity, salinity, and pH, and so on, that a species can tolerate. That's that word, tolerance, tolerate. Um, if they go too high or too low, the species is going to die. Outside of the species range of tolerance, they can't survive. So the combination of all the abiotic conditions under which a species could possibly survive, grow, and reproduce, that is called its fundamental niche. And let's take a look at this picture over here. So um, you can see that this looks like a bell curve, right? Here's our curve. Do, 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 do. And of course, things moved and now my curve looks weird. But okay, so here we go. Here's our bell curve, okay? So in the middle here, in this dark blue area, is our preferred niche. Preferred niche means it's got all the stuff that we want in terms of abiotic conditions. So it's got the right pH. Here's pH down here. It's got the right temperature, um, whatever else. It could be the right amount of sunlight. It could be the amount, right amount of humidity. Whatever it is, it's got what we need in the way that we want it. So this is what's called our optimum range. Um, outside of this and the bottom part of our, our curve right here, we've got these lighter blue areas right? The species can still survive here. This is within its range of tolerance, but we call this the zone of physiological stress, meaning that the organisms are there, they are surviving, but they're kind of feeling bad. They're kind of feeling stressed. Uh, these organisms, their ability to survive and reproduce is lower than the organisms that are in that preferred niche because these guys are under physiologic stress. Anytime you're under stress, your ability to survive and reproduce is lowered. Outside of these marginal niches right here, we have our zones of intolerance. These are areas that, for whatever reason, the abiotic conditions are outside of the species um, tolerance range. Could it be too acidic? It could be too alkaline. That's where I'm looking right here. It could be too cold. It could be too hot. Um, it could be too sunny. It could be too shady. Whatever it is, the organisms, the species cannot survive in those conditions biotic factors. So we were talking before about abiotic factors, but biotic factors can further limit the locations and conditions under which a species can live. So biotic niche limiting factors include things like inter and intraspecific intra competition. So interspecific means um, you're fighting between two different species. Intraspecific means you're fighting within your own species. 
Predation can also be a factor. Disease can be a factor. So these are biotic factors that can limit the niche that you occupy. So the range of abiotic and biotic conditions under which a species actually lives is called its realized niche. So its fundamental niche is where can it possibly live? The realized niche is where does it actually live? And the difference between the two of those is primarily our, um, our biotic factors. Realized niches are always gonna be narrower than fundamental niches, and that is the, it's because of biotic limiting factors like competition, predation, and disease. The distribution of a species in an area is pretty much determined by its realized niche, okay? So again, abiotic conditions set up the fundamental niche. Where can the species possibly live in all the places um, that doesn't kill it outright, right? Um, whether or not that's the perfect place or it's a marginal place, where can it possibly live? That niche is further narrowed by stuff like competition, predation, and disease to produce the realized niche. Species can be niche generalists or niche specialists. And believe it or not, you actually already know what these are, even though you may not have heard the terms. Niche generalists can live under a wide range of biotic and abiotic conditions. So uh, these are species that are happy in, in multiple environments. Um, they have a very wide range of things that they can tolerate. Niche, niche specialists can only live under a very narrow range of conditions. Niche specialists are much more vulnerable to extinction when environmental conditions change. If you can only tolerate a very narrow range of conditions, when those environmental conditions change, you might go extinct if you can't adapt fast enough. Environmental change alters species distribution. For example, pollen records. We can actually go back and we, we can recreate what the ancient earth looked like um, from pollen records. They show us that the species distribution of trees in North America has changed like a lot, a lot since the last ice age. Global climate change is predicted to also change our current distribution of tree species even more. Changes in temperature and precipitation are going to be the main drivers of the change in tree distribution. Um, and in fact, to find out more about this, and I encourage you to do so, please look in your book because they have maps that show this. Um, at the end of the last ice age, um, the distribution and the types of trees across North America were very different than the, what they currently are. And as global climate change accelerates, it's going to continue to change. It's already changing even as we speak. If environmental change is drastic enough or rapid enough, you're gonna have species extinctions. The fossil record is both a record of evolution, but it's also a record of extinctions. So we know lots of stuff from the fossil record. We know what used to live on Earth, but we also know that they are no longer here. So it's a, it's a record of how they evolved, but also a record of um, why they died out. So the Earth has experienced five previous mass extinction events. A mass extinction occurs when large numbers of species go extinct in a relatively short period of time. Now, when we say relatively short period of time, we're talking geologic time. So that might be hundreds of thousands of years. But in terms of geologic time, that's actually very short. The greatest mass extinction event was the Permian-Triassic event. It took place 251 million years ago, and it marked the end of the Paleozoic era and the beginning of the Mesozoic era. About 90% of aquatic species and 70% of terrestrial species went extinct. That was a huge extinction event. Life took a drastic downturn. Now, do we know what caused this? We don't. We actually, um, we have theories on what caused it, but the cause of that extinction, of that really, really big mass extinction, is not definitively known. Um, there is always a component of climate change in extinctions, and that's one part of it, but we're not 100% sure. There's probably many factors that actually led to this very large um, mass extinction event. 
Most scientists now believe that we are experiencing a sixth mass extinction. We're in the midst of it right now. This is the only extinction event, the only one ever that has been human induced. Recovery from earlier mass extinctions has taken an average of 10 million years. And when I say recovery, I mean in terms of species, biodiversity. This is an impossibly long time by human standards. Humans haven't even been on Earth for 10 million years. So when we're talking about like recovery from a mass extinction event, do we really have this amount of time to wait to recover from um, such a large reduction in our species diversity, especially since we're the ones driving it? This is a uh, graph of the past five extinction events, and I'd like to just take a look at this real quick. So here's our extinction occurrences where you see the, the, the peaks right here. Um, these are the mass extinction events that we were talking about, one, two, three, four, five. Um, this extinction event at 450 million years ago was the end of the Ordovician period. Um, and the beginning of the Silurian, by the way. Um, right over here, we had the end of the Devonian. A Devonian um, was uh, kind of the era of the fishes. So we had the rise of the reptiles after the end of the Devonian. Um, the end of the Ordovician saw the rise of the fishes. So in between here, we had lots of speciation take place. In between here, we had lots of speciation take place. And you can actually see um, that there were minor extinction events throughout here. That's what these peaks and valleys are through each of these things. There's peaks and valleys here. Um, this one right up here, the end of the Permian, was the Permian-Triassic that we talked about, um, the, the largest mass extinction in the history of, in Earth's history, where we lost 90% of our aquatic and 70% of our terrestrial life. And there it is right there, that peak. Um, so here's the Permian, and this event right here marked the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic period. We had another um, extinction event that marked the end of the Triassic, which is right here. So in between here, you can see that we're actually uh, we're actually not we're not having a ton of extinction events. We're actually doing what we call speciation, where there's a uh, different lots of different species that are evolving and um, filling the niches that were abandoned when the species all died. So again, we've got speciation. The Triassic ends, and we've got speciation between the Triassic and the um, and the Cretaceous. So this is present day right here. You can see zero right here, and um, we are. Again, most scientists believe we're in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, and it is. Um, human caused. So one of the reasons that we think that is because um, there is a rate of background extinction, meaning that species naturally go extinct. We know this, right? Um, and that rate is actually um, calculated. If you, can be, you can calculate it. How do we calculate it? Well, I'm showing you right here how we calculate it. We've got all this data from the fossil record, and it's all in this area right here. So in these smaller um, these smaller eras where things were actually going extinct, this is our background ex extinction rate. So we know species go extinct all the time, um, and they go extinct at a certain rate. Well, they're going extinct at, at that same background rate um, now, but we've actually accelerated the pace. Uh, how much faster we're making species go extinct is kind of a matter of debate, but it's actually, you know, scientists are saying we're, we're actually causing species to go extinct at, a, at about a rate of 10 times faster than the natural um, background extinction rate, meaning the natural rate that species normally go extinct. So we are forcing a mass extinction event um, due to our disturbance of the Earth's systems. And we're going to talk, obviously, more about that in class.